all I could see was this light coming at me. And it just got closer and closer and closer. And then finally, it just kind of hovered over me. And I could see in the light, in this, in this light, it looked like brighter than, than the noonday sun, there was uh, the man, Jesus of Nazareth. I said, Lord, are you really like this? Are you really like this awesome? You know, that's what I was really saying. Yeah. And he said, he said, he said three words. He said, yes, I am. Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode eight. I interview Keith Thibodeau, known for his role as Little Ricky on the I Love Lucy show. He shares his life before Christ, and despite his gift to play the drums, his fame as Little Ricky, he eventually found himself being tormented by voices in his head telling him to kill himself as a result of his search for truth in drugs and the occult. He cried out to God, and his life has not been the same since. We talk about I Love Lucy, being slain in the spirit, forgiveness for his father, and so much more. So with no further ado, let's get weird. My testimony, uh, it, it, it just kind of goes, uh, like you said, way back. I mean, it starts when I was a little boy. And as you wrote, you, you know, you read my book, uh, Life After Lucy. And um, it starts out when I was about two years old. I was... Um, I was born in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, son of a Cajun mom and dad. Um, basically, they lived in Bro Bridge, Louisiana, which is the crawfish capital of the world. Wow. And then, I, then I, I was born in Lafayette, but uh, at the age of two years old, uh, we lived in Bunky, Louisiana, which is a little town north of Lafayette. My dad was working for uh, uh, a gas company. Um, like a natural gas company, United Gas. And um, I started like playing around on pots and pans with knives and forks and playing these rhythms and, and all this. And, and then uh, the trash cans back in those days were all tin, you know, they weren't like plastic, they were like, like metal, you know? Yeah. So they had these little tops on them like that. And uh, I'd, I'd get these sticks and I'd play, uh, rhythms on the on on the trash can you know while we were playing in the backyards with my friends and stuff and uh, at two years old uh, I was quite young but I had a sister who was uh, right behind me so she was like one year old and I guess we would just kind of fool around on these on, the, on these uh, you know makeshift drums you know yeah I I would hear like like big band you know radio um parades high school parades my dad would take me to yeah so I, I'd have all these these you know this music inside me and and um, one day my our neighbor who lived next door to us told my my parents that that you know they needed to get me a drum set and my dad said you know why and they, they said well it sounds like he's playing rhythm on the trash cans in the backyard so so anyway my dad got me a drum set well, actually, it wasn't a drum set. It was like a toy drum. And so I played around with this toy drum. I was excited about it, but it was cheap. So it ended up, I broke it, you know, and I told my dad, I announced to my dad one day, I said, you know, dad, uh, I want a real drum. And so he, uh, he broke down, bought me a snare drum, I guess, a real snare drum. And I started playing the snare drum and I started just playing around and I, I got pretty good at it. So good that, that my dad would take me to these clubs, like the Lions Club meetings and Kiwanis Club meetings, these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I would be just playing these cool little rhythms, I guess, as a kid. And they would just be, you know, they say, golly, you know, you, you, your child does. He's good, you know. Yeah. So uh, one day. Uh, I guess I added a couple more drums, like a like a kick drum, and I began to uh, add more drums to my my uh, my arsenal there. And uh, a guy named Horace Hype, who had a, a big band in the 1950s, um, he was pl uh, playing in uh, his his show had come to Lafayette, which is where we moved back to. And so my uncle heard about it, and he told my dad about it. He said, you know, they have a 
a talent show in this in this um, this show, the Horse Height, the pretty famous. At that point, he uh, he had like a national show called the Swift Premium Hour, which was on television, and he discovered people like Art Carney and Gordon McRae. Some of these people, I don't know how if they remember all these old people, but um, but Art Carney was on the Honeymooners, which was a very uh, popular uh, television show, funny show, and um, but so he had this talent show. It's kind of like a, a local talent show, so. I entered the talent show as a kid and played the drums and won the talent show. So, you know, my dad's thinking, you know, you know, this, this, this boy must have, you know, he's got Hollywood, you know, all written all over him, you know? Yeah. And uh, so my dad went, went over to Mr. Height and he said, um, Mr. Height, do you think my son has any, any future in show business? And uh, Horace Height said, no, Mr. Thibodeau, I don't think he does. Uh, it's too bad. I mean, we would love to have him on the show, but, uh, you know, we've already got a, a little drummer boy that's about 12 years old that, that's on our show as a regular. So we don't really have room for two drummers on the show. And but you're, you're uh, three years old at this point, right? Well, I, yeah, yeah, we need to jump four. I'm about three and a half, four, somewhere around that. Okay. And, uh, and so... Then Mr. Height um, calls my dad two weeks later and says, uh, Mr. Thibodeau, um, we'd love to, to bring your son on our show as a regular. And so my dad is floored. So he says, well, yeah, but I work at you know, United Gas Company and I've got a family, I've got to support. And he goes, well, well, we'll pay you a salary and you know, we will include your son in on it. You, you come on the road with us. So we immediately start touring with Horace Height and started uh, a show in North Carolina. I think it was um, Durham, North Carolina, and then went on to do like the East Coast, all up New York and, you know, the, the North New England states into Canada. I think we, we were in Toronto and, um, you know, played all over, you know, um, I went on the road. I guess I was about four years old at this time. So. That was uh, the, kind of the beginning of my, you know, my showbiz uh, or musical abilities that catapulted me to California, which was where uh, Mr. Height or Horace Height had um, a ranch that he uh, that he had a bunch of bungalows. And so his band was there. And so during the hiatus or the time off from his show, the whole show would just go to California, L.A. and hang out and rest and, and regroup and rehearse and do things like that. So my whole family moved to California and we went uh, to, to Los Angeles and um, lived there for a short period of time. And uh, until another friend of my dad, uh, a guy named Fred Dodge, told my dad about an interview that they were having at a uh, big studio in, in LA. And they were looking for a kid to play the part of I Love Lucy's Little Ricky. Um, so which was a big show in the 1950s, the I Love Lucy show starring Lucio Ball and Desi Arnaz. And uh, so that show, um, they, had, they had had like, uh, like these twins, two sets of twins that played the part, but they were basically infants and toddlers. They had no speaking lines. So they were looking to to write more stories around the little Ricky and, and just, you know, they, it was it was a successful show and they just wanted to expand on it. And so um, the fact that I played the drums and I looked like Desi, uh, that was a big, big um, plus for me as a as a uh, potential um, uh, candidate for this uh, this role. There were like 200 um uh, boys that tried out for the part and so when they got to me um i walked on the set and lucio ball was there you know bigger than life i like to say and uh she uh she looked at me and she looked at my dad and she said well he's cute but uh but what does your uh what does your son do right. and and so he said well you know he actually plays the drums and she's she just couldn't believe it she goes yeah. Well, you know, there's our orchestra drums over there. There's a set. Just 
we'll right. set that up and you can play it. So that's what happened. I started playing the drums and and then uh, Desi came over and all these stagehands came over and these famous this famous producer Sheldon Leonard Leonard who was uh, had produced the Danny Thomas show and the, the Bill Dana show and the, uh, the Andy Griffith show and uh, was on It's a Wonderful Life the movie. Um, he came over and they were just enjoying this little kid, you know, playing the drums and just looking at us, looking at me like, well, what's going on with this? So Desi uh, started playing with me and jamming, jamming with me on the set. And he stood up and laughed and said, I think we found a little Ricky. So at that point, I was signed to a seven year contract with the uh, Dallas Lucy show. Or, or Desi Lou Studios, which yeah. incorporated I Love Lucy. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, um, excuse me. Um, all right, so let me, uh, I guess I'll, I'll back up before, before we continue. I, I do have some questions um, on that. So you, it, it blew my mind reading the book that you were playing at such a young age. Do you ever remember getting the idea of this is what the drums are, this is how you play the drums, or was that just something that just came out of you naturally? I mean, it, it just came out. I mean, it was like, you know, there are some people in this world that that are kind of born to do things, you know? Yeah. Um, and it could be any kind of different thing. It could be basketball. It could be whatever, you know, they just naturally like take to it like a duck, you know, to the water, you know? And so I, I just had this rhythm in me and it had to come out. Yeah, no. That, that blew my mind. I have a, a four-year-old daughter. And so when I heard that you were playing on stage and performing at that young age, um, even just playing it, a simple rhythm at the age of two uh, just, just blew my mind. Um, but I, I think that's part of your story that just shows uh, that, you know, God just bestows gifts on people. Uh, and I don't feel there's any other way to really explain that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue in your story and, and see, um, you know, how, how you have you used that, that gift. Obviously, this, uh, you, you know, you attributed that to landing you this role um, in this, you know, show that's larger than life. I'm here. I am. I'm a millennial. Of course. So, I, so when I read the book, um, it was interesting to see just the impact that that had on television and on Hollywood in, in general at the time. Um you know, I, I took all that, you know, for granted, because I, I think I was introduced to the show through Nickelodeon's uh, Nick at Night. They would they would play the, the reruns. I didn't realize that Desi actually invented the rerun. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so that so that was pretty fascinating. So, you know, you're on this show. Um, talk about your relationship uh, with the Arnez family. Uh, well, I mean. I, I guess there, there are people in, in our lives that, that we meet and, uh, you know, we develop friendships with and, you know, we all have those kinds of things and we have people that we kind of know and there are people we just kind of, you know, they, they're in our life for a day or they might be for, you know, a season or whatever. But, uh, and then there are those kind of people that really uh, come into your life and there's an influence in your life. You know, they, they come in and there's an influence and, um, and a, a big influence, uh, a directional influence. And so I think that um, Lucy and Desi, um, uh, they were very special people. They were very um, talented, of course, um, very um, passionate people uh, who knew their business, which was acting and show business. And um, we're very professional and had done it for a long, long time. And so by the time Lucy got to uh, the series, she had already been like a B, a B movie actress, you know, like uh, starred in a lot of different um, yeah. movies in Hollywood with all the big actresses and actors, you know. Um, so she had this background um, and wanted it really bad. And um, the I Love Lucy show, um, was interesting in that uh, it was a take on 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 them, but it was it was it was little aspects of them in their re, in their real life 
but it was in another sense, it was not anything like they were in real life. So people like to think that Lucy was like this hilarious, you know, person all the time, wacky, crazy, loony, uh, like, like the show is, but she was really very serious, very serious individual, uh, very intense in individual, very passionate. Um, we got along really good. Uh, she, on, on the set, she would tell the, the crew members that, um, you know, there was absolutely no cussing, you know, and Keith was on the stage. And um, the, the first thing um, she said when I walked, you know, when I came to the first uh, uh, rehearsal day was that, okay, you know, and, you know, we were sitting around reading the script for the, for the, for the show. And um, uh, she, I said, I called her Mrs. Ball or Miss Ball. Right. And, and she said, oh, don't call me that. And I'm like five years old, you know, I'm like, right. I just, I, I joined the show when I was five. And um, she said, call me Lucy and call, you know, Desi, Desi and, and uh, Bill, Bill and Viv, Vivian, Vivian, you know, yeah. um, it, it was first name basis, you know. So here I was this little kid, five years old, when I'm in a world where, you know, you're supposed to call your especially back in those days you called everybody by mr or mrs you know yeah and uh, and so it was a very so it was this working relationship that she was trying to bring out but at the same time you know there was this motherly instinct too because i was a child that she did take care uh, of me on the set and um they 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 just did some great things they uh she would give me presents you know and different things on the set um uh, you know, bikes and, and uh, she gave me two sets of drums. Uh, I have one set that I still, I still have today and it's a 1957 set of Gretsch. Um, Desi would, anytime that he would give his kids presents or gifts, he'd always, if I was around, he'd always include me in on it. So we went to Rams games, we, you know, we got football uniforms, we got our own private, you know, our own customized bowling balls because we were into bowling, you know, and with our name on it. And so it was just, they were just very, um, uh, I, you know, very different people than my mom and dad. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And in my life, you know, they lived in Beverly Hills. I lived in San Fernando Valley. So it was like, you know, it was a different world. You mm -hmm. know, it was the world of the Rolls Royces and the, the Bentleys and the, the Ferraris. And on my, my world, it was the, you know, everyday American life that I lived, you know? So I kind of had two different lives. Yeah. Um, well, so your book is called Life After Lucy. And really, I think that's where, um, you know, the, the mo most interesting, you know, it's fascinating to hear about, you know, your time on set and, and doing the show. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the real story here, uh, hence the title life after Lucy um, is a, uh, is what happens from there. Uh, so, so talk about, you know, the time in between, um, you know, the show being over uh, and then you moving back home. Okay. Well, the show was over when my dad uh, was driving us back from the studio. He, he actually got a job at the studio when I was on the show and um, he was worked for public relations for the studio and um and so he was driving me home uh one late afternoon and said well keith I, he said uh i guess uh you know you're out of a job you know <laughs> and I, I didn't know what he meant by that but he said that the that the show had terminated because i asked him why and he said that lucy and desi just couldn't you know they couldn't get along anymore to do the show uh and to be civil about it so uh, the show was going to end and for everybody's best interest. And that's what happened. And so I was out of a job at the age of nine years old. And I was on, I was on the unemployment line. And uh, as a, as a nine year old, if you can think about that. Um, and uh, it, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of in a way, just, just like a shock because I was thinking, well, you know, I was, I was just at that point, really, really, kind of getting into the the idea of being an actor yeah uh, whereas in in earlier I, I just 
you know, I was more of a musician. I, I wasn't an actor. I was a musician. And so, but, but I kind of got into, I was best friends with their children, Desi and Lucy Jr. And uh, I would spend a lot of time at their home and, and, and all that. But, um, you know, I saw them fighting back at home and knew that there were problems there and knew that they, was a, they were very, uh, very difficult household. They were getting fights and, and Desi and I and Lucy would look at each other and hiding in the, back, the bushes in the backyard, hearing all these, you know, horrendous fights and stuff and uh, glass crashing and cursing and all this. And we just look at each other and it was just sad. It was just like, you know, well, there they go again. You know? And um, it, it, was, uh, it was a sad situation, but um, I, uh, you know, I, I was, I always loved being a normal kid, the idea of being a normal kid. And so that kind of gave me a little reprieve for a while. And so living up in the valley, living in the valley, San Fernando Valley was a different life than Beverly Hills, but, um, I had friends over there. We played, you know, sports and stuff like that. But uh, uh, my dad still worked for the studio at that time. And so he um, he began seeing a young lady and uh, I was still involved with the, the studio. Desi Jr. and I would still do like warm ups for the show, for the Isle of Lucy show, where we play the drums with the orchestra and and, uh, you know, We'd, we'd warm up the live audience before the show. Sometimes they'll have comedians that do that, but sometimes, you know, they'll have other kinds of entertainment. So we did that. And um, we took this young lady home one night that my dad said, well, you gotta be really nice to this young lady. And so I thought there's something funny about that. And so we got in his car and she got in the front and um, took her to her apartment in Hollywood. and. And he got out of the car. He said, I'm going to walk her to, to her door, you know, and they were gone like probably a half hour, you know, sitting out in the car. And I was thinking, well, it's something really weird about that. So anyway, to make a long story short, my dad was having an affair with this, with this young secretary that worked in the studio. And um, I kind of knew it. I was the only one in my family of six. I was the oldest of six brothers and sisters by this, at this time. And uh, I knew that. And I knew that, um, uh, it, it was something that my mother would, you know, if, if I said anything about it, that would be the end of our family, you know, probably. Yeah. We were, we were a Catholic family. We, uh, you know, we were very religious in that, in that aspect. I went to Catholic school when I wasn't on the set and um, went to Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school up until about uh, sophomore or junior high school. And um, it was a, it was a big, big shock when I went with my dad and mom uh, in Christmas of 1965, I believe. And um, we were going to get gifts from my brothers and sisters, my younger brothers and sisters. And um, she found, my, my, my mom found a, 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 a Christmas card in the glove compartment of my dad's car. And it said it was addressed to my dad and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, as you can imagine, the whole thing just, you know, accusations. And, and here I was in the back seat of the car having to hear all this. And um, needless to say, you know, our Christmas was, was uh, you know, people have bad memories of Christmas. It's a lot of times, you know, it, it just brings back bad memories to some people. And I can see how that, that, that happens. But because uh, every Christmas, you know, it, it just kind of reminds me of, of that time in a way you know yeah. and um so we went back home and and uh, a lot of tears a lot of you know angry words and and hurt and you know at that point uh i just i got in my bed that night you know after all that happened and i just shook my my fist you know to god you know and just said god I said, how could you let this happen, you know? And I, I, I was just enraged because it was like my whole life, I, I knew my whole life was gonna be destroyed by this. Um, and I, I, I just shook my hands at, at, at the Lord that I didn't know. And I said, you know, well, you're gonna pay for this. 
And uh, if I could ever give anybody any kind of advice, don't ever tell God he's going to pay for anything or, uh, you know, threaten the most high God about anything. Yeah. Uh, it's not the, not the one to do. So um, uh, at that, at, at that time, you know, we just, you know, we stayed in California for a few months, kind of regrouped and my mom, you know, kicked my dad out of the house, of course. And, uh, that was uh, the beginning of us transitioning to back to Louisiana because there was no, you know, my mom didn't work anywhere. We didn't have any money. So we went to, um, uh, we were, we were uh, at kind of like the mercy of my, my aunts and uncles back home. So my mom took us all back to Lafayette and we stayed with, with uh, my mom's sister and uh, their husband, my mom's sisters and their husband. And uh, they took us in and blessed us really, really good. And, um, you know, fed us and, and, and kept, you know, kept us during this time, you know, just basically it was a family helping one another. And that's, that's what families are for, for those kinds of things. And um, uh, started going to high school in, in, in Louisiana, junior at this point. And, um, you know, this is basically when I tried to start hiding my my life, you know, from everyone else and try to put on a good front. And um, people would ask, you know, where's where's your dad? You know, and I was 15 years old and I, and uh, I would tell them that my dad was, you know, he was working in another state, and you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, I didn't say anything about the divorce because in those days, you know, Sam, it, it was uh, it was uh, you like to be called Sam or Sam uh sam's fine it's fine sam's fine um and in those days you know divorce was was like very um not very common you know it happened you know but it wasn't as common as it is now um so i would just lie and i lie about a lot of things and uh but just to kind of keep this front going and uh but at the same time i was i was trying to distance myself from hollywood and the whole little Ricky thing. And, uh, you know, my friends would bring up, you know, Hey, this guy used to be little Ricky on the Alabaster show. And, you know, it would just embarrass me. I, I, at that point in my life, I didn't want to be associated with any of that because it just, it just brought back bad memories. Cause you know, I would think, think, uh, in my mind, you know, if I hadn't, I've had this talent of drums and, and, and brought the family to California, this would have never happened to our family. Our family would still be together. You know, my dad wouldn't have gone, you know, for this secretary. The Hollywood would not have captured his uh, heart, you know. And um, So these are kind of things that I would, you know, tell myself. And so I ended up smoking cigarettes, you know, doing kind of what everybody else did at that in the late 60s, you know, it was the sex, drugs and rock and roll, uh, and flower child days, you know, all this. And uh, I started just, you know, losing myself in in that in that uh, that high school, um, later high school culture, um, and, and just doing what my friends were doing, you know, uh, um, looking uh, for for things and in, in you know, searching, just kind of searching for myself, you know, as as a lot of people were at that at that time. And I began to play music with some uh, some some friends I had buddies I had in high school, and we had a garage band, and you know, just started that that whole thing because that was the thing I knew to do was was to play the drums, yeah. And that was the, that was the best thing uh, that I could contribute at that point, you know, in my life. Right. Um. So you, so you basically, you, you blamed Hollywood for, you know, kind of how, you, you know, for your divorce and, and, and did you, how much of that did you bring on yourself, uh, you know, being sort of the reason that you moved out to Hollywood and how much of that was just the industry um, in general? And yeah, how much I mean, of that was, was on your father? Well, I mean, on hindsight, you know, a lot of it was on my, you know, my dad too. Um, uh, he he always wanted to go to Hollywood, 
And so this was like my dad's break. And so he sort of saw himself in me. And, you know, you, you, you talk about these stage moms and stage, stage dads. Well, he was, he was kind of like that in, 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 a, in a way. Um, uh, one thing about my dad that, you know, that I did appreciate was the fact that at one point in his life, he did, there was some fear of God in him you know that that he was a, a, a had some god fearing um stuff to him um after one of the shows the alice shows ended um we were driving home at night and uh, after one of the episodes and i did really good and he would you know he, he would give me a present or whatever if i did real good some kind of thing that i wanted uh kind of reward me type of thing and um i i particularly one night I remember asking him as we were driving home I said I said I said why did you know why did God pick me to do this little Ricky thing you know he, he could have picked any other little boy you know and it was I, I felt kind of like well you know I felt like because I was little Ricky somehow God saw me more than he did some others you know right. because I was I was more famous so I looked at God like he looked at famous people more than he looked at the common person. And so, right. but it, I knew there was something special about it, but it, it was, it was kind of like my own reasonings about things, you know? And my dad said, uh, he said, well, Keith, he said, God has a purpose for you. He has a reason that you were little Ricky, you know? And yeah. I, I, he said, I think he said something like, you know, you're to bring joy or, happiness to people through the part or whatever you know but um it it i just remember that part about it but uh that as far as blaming myself for something i think that it was um i i think that you know obviously on hindsight i can't blame myself for that that that's i don't i don't still blame myself for that i don't i don't still look at look at look at that in 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 a way that i did before I was uh, I was born again, and um, I I look at it now as you know the way the way God planned it, you know, the way God works all things out for the good for those who are called according to His purposes, you know, and um, so I don't you know whatever I thought before I came to the Lord, it's like I, I since I was born again, I have a completely different mindset you know i can understand why i thought like that but now it's i see like god sees it you know in that perspective you know from an eagle instead of a chicken you know yeah um so you know you reference in the book um your insecurities which on the surface seemed hard to believe because you know here you are this you know young boy with all this talent um, and you're performing and you're traveling and you land this role. Um, and, uh, you know, everything seems, uh, like that would breed confidence in somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, so explain where, where did the insecurities come from? You think? I think it was the insecurities probably came from trying to please my dad. Um, in a lot of things, um, I, you know, my, my dad would always say, you know, do good, Keith, you know, I want you to do good, you know, and I, I think I was trying to please my dad, even though I didn't really want to do a lot of things he wanted me to do, you know, in my heart, I didn't really want to do those things, so um, I, it was, I don't know, it was just kind of like I was just, uh, I did have a lot of insecurities. I, I was very shy. My mother's a shy person, you know, by personality. Um, and I believe, you know, I had a little bit of her shyness and, and, and all that. And um, I don't know, it, my dad and mom are two different completely, you know, they're two different people, you know. My dad was always all about, you know, show business in Hollywood. And my mom was more down to earth and more just, you know, culturally more down to earth you know i guess i don't know yeah yeah you know kind of based on 
from you know, what I read in your book, you know, it kind of seems to describe that that time of being kind of shooting and spending time with Yarnez family and spending time at home. There was kind of like, you know, a duality there um, or just, you know, just a, a different experience as you kind of described earlier. Um, all right. So I want to, you know, I, I want to continue in your story uh, because, you know, you're, you're back home now and you're starting to, you know, you, you mentioned you're angry at God and you're starting to kind of explore yourself. You want to distance your, yourself from, you know, your, your career as, as little Ricky, um, mm -hmm. you're getting back into, to rock and roll now. Um, so, you know, how, how did, uh, how did you come to know Christ from, from that point? Um, well, I started, I started playing with this. I actually met this band. Um, the name of it is David and the Giants. And uh, they were a regional rock band uh, based in Mississippi. And I lived in Louisiana. And when I was 16 years old, the band that I've been playing with my high school buddies, uh, we, we had like a little record out and we had a little, we had a little local hit, you know. And so uh, this manager of ours, his name was Ben Skolnick. He was like this typical, you know, manager guy, Jewish kind of guy, you know, uh, looked like the mafia kind of guy or something, you know, and uh, he would, he, he took me down and you know, another band made down to Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, to the Vapors Club, which was a very famous uh, nightclub that uh, would, would feature groups like uh, Little Richard, you know, Jimi Hendrix um, was his backup guitar player, the Almond Brothers, when they were a, a group called the, the, the Almond Joy and uh, just kind of famous acts like that. And so David and the Giants were, were a house band there. And, um, and so my manager uh, introduced me to the manager of the club and, and uh, wanted me to sit in with the band, David and the Giants, so that if I did well, then my band could come and play. Right. The club. So, so that's how I met David and the Giants. I, I sat in a song with them in this in this nightclub in Mississippi, and uh, and uh, first of all, they didn't want me to, to play because I was this kid, you know. And they told the manager, "Oh, you know, we can't have this kid play with us." So the manager told him, "No, you let this kid play or whatever." So I, I played uh, a song with him, and he said, um, "He said, well, what do you want to play?" And I said, "Well, anything." And he just kind of laughed, you know, like, "Okay." I said, just, just play your fastest song. I don't care, whatever it is. Yeah. As a kid, you know, and he, they're going, yeah, right. Okay. We're going to, we're going to give him a harder song or whatever, you know? Yeah. How old were you yeah. at this point? I was 16. Okay. Yeah. And so um, at this point um, I played the song and they were just kind of blown away by, by the, by, by how I played the song. And uh, David asked the, the manager of the club, he said, who is that kid? He said, who is that little kid? And the guy said, well, that's little Ricky, <laughs> you know, from the Island Lucy show. And David said, wow, you know. So anyway, at that point, that would have been the first time I met that group, uh, David Huff and his brothers, Raber and Claiborne. And so I started um, a relationship with them. I would see them often. They would come to town, to my town, and I'd go over and watch them play and hang out with them a little bit. And, um, and I, you know, I just continued to play drums and, and rhythm and blues clubs in, in Lafayette, uh, uh, just the local music there. And um, they came after a, a playing in town one night, they came to hear me at a club uh, late after their, their gig. And um, they just, David called me about a week later and said, you know, they would love to, to have me as a drummer. And at this, at this, uh, Point in my life I was about I was just turned 19 so uh, you know I was he said would you could you move to Mississippi and I said sure you know because at that point I I basically had gotten into a lot of drugs you know marijuana LSD my, my friend uh, my best friend a musician friend who was in the band with me at the local band he uh, he ended up you know like really just freaking out on LSD and kind of lost his mind basically and 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 today is today uh, handicapped in that way and lives in a disabled area 
uh, a very talented, you know, smart guy, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to get away from that scene. And so David and the Giants, they were a strange kind of band at the time because they were like these long haired guys. But at the same time, you know, they had all these these girls, you know, groupies hanging around and stuff. But they were very cool, but did no drugs. And they didn't drink either. And it was very strange. So I said, well, you know, maybe maybe I can just kind of get out of this scene that I'm in and just be over there and do that. But anyway, the times and the, and the seasons and all that just, just basically did not leave us alone. And, uh, you know, even in Mississippi, you know, the drugs and the, the whole cultural lifestyle was just all around us. So uh, it, it got to me again. And, and I, I convinced uh, one of the guys in the band, Rayburn, one of the brothers to, to start drinking. And so he started drinking and um, then they, they started doing marijuana. And, and then it just, you know, it was just this, um, I was basically the, the bad influencer in the whole thing, you know, right. yeah. by this point, you know, so um, I, I um, you know, thinking about my friend back in Louisiana that it, that it uh, lost his, uh, his mind really and his life, uh, I began to think of myself in the same way because I, I had done the very same things that he did. And I was thinking, well, golly, you know, and I began to hear a lot of demonic voices in my head. And, and uh, of course, the lifestyle that I led, led at that time didn't, didn't help any because, you know, we were into sex with, with you know, unbridled sex and drugs and drinking and um you know i would date girls and find out that they were like witches and just all this weird supernatural things i would read books on the occult and so i would kind of i was always interested in the supernatural um because drugs have a way of kind of opening you up to that and it's uh unfortunately drugs will bring you into the dark part of the supernatural they will not lead you to god or any kind of uh, any kind of positive enlightenment at all. Um, so I began to, uh, to really become depressed and really, really paranoid and would hear voices in my head. And these voices would, would just be tormenting me night and day, um, you know, telling me like to throw myself, you know, out of my sports car going 120 miles an hour down the highway and uh, just just all these different voices, you know, would just come. And and I thought I was really losing my mind like my friend. And I, I was and I got to the point where I was thinking about killing myself at one point. And um, I knew that once I began to have suicidal thoughts, that that this was I was either going to die or I was going to end up in a mental institution. And I'd not gone to any doctors, anything like that. So I, I didn't, it was just me and, you know, I remember talking to a friend, um, one of the roadies for, uh, for the band, his name is Big Jerry, I'll never forget it. I said, uh, I felt like I was, you know, felt suicidal, you know? And he just looked at me and he said, man, you just gotta be strong, man. You just gotta, just gotta, just gotta be like a robot, just, just push your way through there, you know, you know, pull your, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, man, and just do it, you know? Yeah. And, and so just, it just, it didn't get to me because I, you know, if you knew how bad I was, man, you wouldn't be saying that, you know, yeah. you would not be saying that. And uh, I remember one evening I was laying in our, in a, in a water bed, which was like, kind of like that kind of a, kind of a thing we had back in those days. Um, yeah. And uh, I just remember crying out to God and, and saying, God, if you're real, if you're really real, I'm so sorry for what I've done. You know, how I made a mess of my, my life and I've gotten to this point. I said, but if you're real, save me out of this mess that I made in my life. And uh, if you do, I'll serve you. And, uh, you know, that's all I did. I woke up the next morning and. And about a week later, um, my mom, my mother had been attending a meeting in Louisiana and it was a, a Catholic 
uh, healing meeting where people were going to these meetings and seeking the Lord to be healed of different things and laying hands on people and, and uh, you know, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was kind of like a Pentecostal, charismatic, Catholic meeting, you know. And these priests and nuns would come and they would, they would all kind of join in and they would, there would be a, a, a couple of people, on, on a girl and a guy strumming an acoustic guitar in the background, you know, and singing these songs. And, and uh, it, it, it just was a very different thing for me because, right. you know, I didn't really want to go to these meetings, but I felt like if I didn't go, I was going to, you know, I didn't know that God had something in, in it for me, you know. Yeah, I just felt like, well, what have I got to lose? You know, I'm just about at the end of my rope, so yeah, I might as well go. I might as well go with my mom and these old ladies to this meeting, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, so it was. Go ahead. Well, actually, so I have a um, a question about that experience, but I have a question. You, you write about um, a, a cocaine trip in in your book, and you you know you mentioned that you know the drugs open you up to um you know the, the supernatural often the, the dark side of that um mm -hmm. but um you know i'd like for you to recall that and my question is like in this experience did you i mean you i think all that you mentioned about in the book is you thought you were losing your mind looking back do you think that that was um i'll go ahead and describe it first and i guess i'll ask my question about uh, you know your thoughts on the experience yeah um well at, at that particular period, uh, I was very, very bad off, as you can guess. But um, the guys, a couple guys in the band had been, you know, fooling around with heroin. And uh, they, uh, they would shoot, you know, share needles in the bathroom uh, of our home and, and just, you know, just do these heroin things, you know, in, in the veins, you know. And uh, I did it a couple times. I probably did it about two or three times. And um, but I tell you what, that 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 is a drug uh, that was made in hell, you know, literally. But um, I could see how people can really just go off the deep end with that, you know, and just just they disappear from life. But um, but I I had a particular night where I did cocaine during this period of time, and. Um, I remember just, you know, with my mental state, doing cocaine didn't help anything because it made me more paranoid about, about things. And um, it just enhanced all my negative feelings, I guess. Instead of like making me feel good initially, it just, it just started making me feel bad. And so I, 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 um, I started hearing, you know, voices in my head and I thought I heard the radio on and and it was talking about me. They were speaking about me on the radio and all this weird stuff, you know. And um, and then, you know, just tossing and turning all night, just freaking out and just laying in my bed. And and uh, in the morning began to break, you know. And I began to hear like a bird chirp. And then it just, you know, another bird chirped. And then another bird. And then they started just, you know, chirping. And then I began to unbelievably hear these birds speaking like it was like a disney movie or something you know like these these nice. these birds speaking you know they were going back and forth like how you doing you know and i was like listening to these you know these birds like speaking they were speaking to one another and then all of a sudden one of them sensed that i was listening and hearing them speak and then they started saying hell this guy's this guy's crazy he's he's, he's hearing us this guy's, you know, started talking about me and, and it was like, oh my goodness. I said, <laughs> I said this is kind of getting out of getting out of hand here. Lord, I, I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be uh, always hearing birds talk, you know. And yeah, you know, and I would definitely be a candidate for the, the, the mental institution. But um I I'd come to the Lord. I, I had that experience with the Lord where and I'm going back to that meeting where where um, I, I had a vision of the Lord and he revealed himself to me and revealed himself that his word is true. And um, I began to to get into the word. But then I then I went back to the band and and 
I just, you know, I, was, I didn't go to any church. Yeah. So I didn't have any fellowship with anybody. So it was just me and the word of God. And so I was like a very baby Christian. And um, at this point, you know, like talking about the birds speaking and talking and hearing me listening to them. Um, I began crying out to God and I said, Lord, you know, help me, help me, Lord, help me, you know, something like that. And, and, and um, one of the birds, you know, they were all just talking, you know, and, and then one, one, one said, Shh. they were like going, Shh. and, and they all started quieted down and the birds thought it stopped, stopped chirping. And, and one of them said, uh, quiet. He's a, he's a servant of the most high God. And at that point, I came up out of that, and I just heard him chirping, you know, like normal, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and like, I was awake. I was awake at, at this time, you know. I wasn't sleeping. And um, so I was so relieved that, you know, I, I didn't hear the birds actually speaking. But then at the same time, I was pretty awestruck that that, that saying, he's a servant of the Most High God that meant something, you know, that meant something to me and maybe it meant something to them. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I believe that, that, that scripturally, you know, that, that, you know, this is my particular thoughts, but I, I believe that before man fell, man could communicate, communicate with the animals. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he named the animals. They were actually man's best friend before, woman right before yeah, eve before women so so i believe that there was some kind of a relational uh, aspect to that and then after sin came then then the fear of man came into the animals and that because of sin and, and that kind of like broke that thing mm, okay yeah so that, that was my question that uh you know i never got answered in the book but that was my curiosity well, i i wanted to know your thoughts of like, if you thought that that was a real experience or, or you, what you were hearing was what they were actually saying or whether you were projecting onto them. Um, Cause I'd heard it like uh, the only instance I'd ever heard of anything like that. I heard a, someone's uh, like near death experience and they said um, they saw their dog um, on the other side and he spoke. And that, so, and so that was sort of like, um, <laughs> he always thought that's like the weirdest part of you know if his experience but he's like that's what happened and so when you when you said that i kind of thought well you know maybe maybe you were kind of got a little peek behind the curtain so to speak um but you know even even like in uh uh in in uh is it is it deuteronomy or uh, where balaam balak balak yeah uh, where the donkey speaks the donkey to, to, to 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 balaam and says you know, uh, he actually speaks to to the yeah. false prophet. You know, yeah. so God opened his mouth. So I believe that there's that capability for that, but it's it's uh, it's not right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I want you to go back and and, and talk about uh, this experience you had at this uh, you know um, meeting with your your mom and her friends um, because you know you said you were. You had a slain in, in the spirit experience, um, mm -hmm. and, and really, prior to reading this in your book, um, like the only thing I really knew about that in, in my mind were kind of what you see on TV with the, the TV preachers, and they're just mm -hmm. hand on the forehead, people are dropping, um, yeah. and uh, you know, I'd always thought that that was, you know, part of a, a scam or hoax. And uh, mm -hmm. I'd never met anyone who actually had a slain um, in the spirit experience. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, walk us um, through that, you know, what happened? Well, I, I would say this, you know, to your, to your, um, um, to your comment on that, that there are definitely scammers out there, you know, there are definitely people who use the gospel for for whatever purposes that they want to and um uh i i believe that that um that god meets us where our faith is you know and uh even a even a somebody who's not really has genuine you know uh, like like balaam okay 
like like the false prophet. He had he had he had the gift of prophecy. He used it for wrong, and he used it for pay. And God, you know, rebuked him through the mouth of a donkey. So I believe there are people out there that you know that that their experiences like that, and it may have a you know, like Jesus said, you know, you did all these things. You, you know, well, Lord, I, I, I healed the sick. Um, I cast out demons. You know, I did all this stuff. And then the Lord says, I never knew you, you know. Yeah, yeah. You worker of iniquity. So, but, but in this case, you know, I would, um, the whole slaying the spirit thing. I mean, it, 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 it's, um, I basically was, uh, the, in the in the Catholic charismatic meeting, uh, there was a priest who was leading the meeting, and he later on left the priesthood and married one of the ladies that were in the uh, the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether he thought, well, maybe you know, I'm just want to follow the word of God, and you know, there's there's no restrictions to being married, so I want to get out of this. Follow the Lord, you know, follow the Lord and get married and do the right thing, you know. Yeah. So, but he he laid hands on me. Um, and prayed for me one night because you know I think they were they were praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit or I don't know what exactly uh, you know the the emphasis of the prayer was uh, or the focus of it but when he prayed I just basically was so relaxed that I just sort of kind of slumping you know I just started I, I mean it wasn't like I was like knocked out or anything. But I just, I just kind of yielded myself. I said, Lord, I just want whatever, whatever you want, Lord, whatever you want. And so I kind of, I kind of fell, you know, to the floor and somebody was back there, you know, like you see in the different things, you know, they just kind of help you down. And so you don't hit your head or whatever. Uh, but I think it was more of a slump, you know, I think. It's, and, and you think about Paul, you know, um, on the road to Damascus, you know, when he yeah. saw uh, the light. He fell off the horse and all the other people fell on the ground like dead men, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was a vision of Jesus. And that's, that's kind of what I had was uh, at that point, I had a vision of Jesus and whatever the experience is, if, if Jesus is not the center of the experience, then it's a false experience. Right. It's a counterfeit experience. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? And right. that's, that, that was my experience was that, and I talk about it in my book uh, where the Lord came to me as a light. And you, you have to back all this up with scripture. You know, you have to, it has to be backed up with scripture because you can have dreams, you can have visions, you can have all these different things. But if you can't back it up with the word of God, then, then it's not, then it's not trustworthy. Right. You know, and that's, that's my experience was that he came to me as a light. And every, like everything around me began to just sort of disappear in my mind. And it was just like I was up in this darkness, you know, like outer space or something. And I saw this light coming from way far off in the distance. And the music that they were playing at the meeting began to fade away. And I couldn't hear any voices. All I could see was this light coming at me. And it just got closer and closer and closer. And then finally, it just kind of hovered over me and i could see in the light in this in this light looked like brighter than than the noonday sun there was um, the man jesus of nazareth and i in my mind i was saying this is jesus of nazareth the one who died two thousand years ago and he was in this light and there was so much love and so much power coming out of this light it was more than the whole universe could contain and all I could describe the experience was like, Jesus is all powerful love. That was what I was, I was sensing out of this. And there was so much compassion and so much empathy. And I, and I, in my spirit, I was having this communication with the Lord and I was going through all my sins and repenting of my sins and saying, what about this sin? What about this awful thing I did, you know, Lord? And I was going through all these different sins in my mind. And, um, and it was like, he said, I know, you know, I know. Because, and when he said, I know, it's like, 
Jesus took our infirmities. He took our sins upon the cross. He knows our sins intimately. He knows every each and every one of our sins and took it on the cross and experienced the wrath of God that was due us on him. And so he was a man just like us, but yet God. So he took all these things upon himself. And um, it's like, I said, Lord. And he said, it's like he was still loving me through all this. All this, this, this conversation, this, this vision conversation I was having with. And I said, Lord, are you really like this? Are you really like this awesome? You know, that's what I was really saying. Yeah. And he said, he said, he said three words. He said, yes, I am. And when he said, yes, I am, I came up and I started hearing the voices around me and I started hearing the music around me and I, I, I stood up and went back to my pew, you know? Wow. And that was that. And I went back in the car, you know, with my mom and her friends or her, her older friends. And I went back and I was just like awestruck. I was thinking, did that really happen? And, and my brother, who was 12 years old at the time, Brian, he actually went up to get prayed with me when I went up. And he went, he, he fell on the ground too. And I said, I said, Brian, did you, did you see a light or anything? Yeah. He said, no. He said, no, I didn't see any light. He's, I said, well, what, what happened? Did anything happen to you? He goes, well, no. He said, I, he said, I was just. I just felt like this hand was holding me to the ground. I couldn't get up. It's like this big hand was just had its hand on my chest and it was just holding me down on the ground. And I was like struggling to get up. I couldn't get up. I said, really? I, I said, well, I said, well, God, you know, I, I told him what, what, what I happened, what happened to me. And I went back home and I started, uh, I took up, took a Bible out. My mom was like in charge of the library at the charismatic meeting. So she had all these books all these Christian books, you know, different uh, faith books and, and um, um, Bibles and different, you know, good news Bibles and all these different kinds of Bibles. And so I, I just had all this stuff in my, 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 I could have, I could read. So yeah. I started reading, I started reading the Bible and I started reading the word of God. And I said, you know what? I said, I want to know the truth. I want to know what the true church is. Because I started reading the Bible and I was going, you know, those priests and nuns in the Catholic Church were there with me. And they were seeking God just like everyone else in that meeting was. Yeah. And so, like, they were no different, you know, because Catholics are taught that the, the nuns and priests are, you know, a step above at least right. yeah. everybody else. Yeah. But they were just like us. So. Wow. Um, that's incredible. So. Um, here you have this experience, you know, I think it's beautiful that, you know, in your brokenness, you cry out to God and then, you know, that experience didn't happen right then and there, but then lo and behold, you know, just a few days later, you know, we, we see an absolute answer, you know, to, to that prayer. Uh, but then here you go and you're right back into, you know, this lifestyle rock and roll with the band. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for me, this is really where your story just, um gets really good we see how god just you know does it does it uh, work uh, in your life it's incredible um so but you're you know you're white knuckling it um you don't you said you don't have any accountability you're not going to church you know it's just you and, and you're reading the bible um so i, I, I want you to I want you to continue uh, from there um and, and what, what happens from there but uh speak about the role of you know christian fellowship and the importance of community uh that plays in the life of a new believer well, I mean, it's so important. I mean, like, like, you know, God just had his hand on me. I mean, literally through all those years, I mean, uh, through all my uh, failings, you know, uh, when I didn't have fellowship with anybody, when I didn't uh, have that accountability, you know, um, we, you know, it was just me and the word, me and the Holy Spirit, uh, me that's what got me through. And I would witness to the guys in the band. I would, I would witness to the guys, uh, our friends out there. The, I, I would witness to, to girls that, that, that were groupies, you know, 
but it all that, you know, it would be like God had his hand on me. And it was like there was so many different um, peels uh, or layers of, of this onion peel that needed to be taken out. You know, once once I came to the Lord, I believe I was born again. But then came the sanctification. Yeah. Then came what God wanted to do to set me apart. First thing he dealt with me before he dealt with me about anything was my, 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 the words that came out of my mouth, my, my mouth, my, my, uh, I, I lying, cursing. I, I would curse. I would lie. All those things. That's the first thing God dealt with me about or the Holy spirit did. And because the, the devil is the father of liars, the Bible says. And, um, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which is edifying, you know, to the hearer. And uh, so those are the first kind of like baby steps that God, okay, we're going we're gonna to take care of this. Yeah. And then it was like, then it was like step by step and layer by layer, things began to peel off. And it was like the Holy Spirit. And that's what I would say that, um, uh, yes, fellowship is so important uh, to 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 hear what god is doing in other people because all this time i was talking to people that god wasn't doing anything but i was just witnessing to those people yeah you know? and, and i was there wasn't anything coming back you know except me and the word so it was a it was a rough period of time and then uh and then when i met my wife you know the bible says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and favor from the lord so simplistically that's kind of what happened to me in 1976 i met my wife kathy and uh, and uh, and you know things began to sort of change you know and things began to change pretty immediately after i was first born again too in that um that things like money you know uh, um uh began to be uh something that i always had like a hole in my pocket i felt like you know, I'd get money and be gone, you know, but I began to have a savings account for the first time. I, I, I actually, I had a little sports car that, um, this, this, I remember one time this, this story, I probably won't get any kind of reward now because I'm telling it, but, but, uh, but I, there was this black man who, um, who used to walk in front of our home with the band when I was still in the band. Uh, and he would, I, I asked him one time, I said, why, why do you keep walking and you know what's going on he's where are you walking to you know what, what are you doing and he said i'm walking to work i said oh really and then the holy spirit spoke to me and said give me your sports car give him that little sports car you know that little austin healy thing you had so you know i got one time went came walking by and uh, i said hey man come over here i want to talk to you and so he was just kind of like what's going on and i said i i want to the lord told me to give you this car right here and boy, he just looked at me like, you're joking, man. What are you talking about? Are you serious? I said, I'm serious, man. The Lord told me to give this to you. I don't, I, I don't really necessarily want to give it to you, but the Lord does. Right. <laughs> so, so, I, you know, it's so funny because I saw the guy, you know, driving with, a, with one of these little English hats, you know, English uh, sports hats, you know, and he drove by with his kids in the car and he was waving, smiling. And it was just great to see that, you know, that was something that God put into me, that, that, that he's a giving God. You know, he's a God who gives it. And so giving it shall be given unto you, you know, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, one man giving unto you, your bosom. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's just, it's just, God can change your life, you know, is, is, the, is the point. And, but fellowship, you've got to have, you've got to know what's going on with other people. You've got to be able to be there to help people, you know, not just bring people to the Lord, which is very important right now, but to, to help people in their walk and for them to speak into your life, too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you mentioned meeting your wife, uh, Kathy, which was one of my favorite parts of the book, um, just hearing um, just hearing that whole story. So uh, speak to your courtship, uh, courtship with, with Kathy. Well, I mean, I met her at, at, a, at, a, at a band concert, David and the Giants, as a secular band. And uh, uh, 
Well, let me go back just real quick. I, I, when, I, when I came to the Lord, I went back to the band and I started telling the band, David and the Giants, I said, you know, there's more to God than what men have led us to believe, you know. I said, God is really real. Jesus is really real. I said, we've got to stop playing this music that we're playing. You know, we could still play the same style of music, but we need to change the lyrics to more godly lyrics. And they, you know, they looked at me like, you know, what, what you flipped out on another drug, you know? And um, I said, uh, I said, no, man, I said, I'm serious. I said, we, we gotta, we gotta start playing, you know, think about it. You know, you guys believe in God. They were God fearing Baptist boys that grew up as Baptists back in the day. And of course they weren't serving the Lord. They were just, you know, in their backslidden, uh, never born again state. And um, they, uh, they, they, anyway, the long story short, David, I kept talking about the Lord and witnessing to them. And David came to the Lord and then told his brothers, and then everybody came to the Lord, and then we became a Christian band uh, in 1979. Uh, we started playing Christian rock in the 80s, but I married Kathy in 1976. That's when I really left the band in, 19, in 1976, um, at the end of 1976, um, but the way we got married, um, I knew there was something special about her, because I you know, I'd been with a lot of groupies and I've been a lot, a lot of these other kinds of um, uh, girls in my life that, that, um, you know, um, just, I, I just was, I just knew that this was something special, special about this girl. And um, she was a ballet dancer, but that wasn't the reason I married her. Uh, but we just, we just connected in some, on some level. And, uh, and, uh, we started seriously thinking, I started really seriously thinking about, you know, asking her to marry me. And uh, I said, well, you know, we both come from, you know, broken homes. Her mom and dad were divorced. My dad and mom were divorced. And I said, well, I, I don't want to make the same mistake, you know, as somebody like my mom and dad, and your dad and mom. And so I said, well, listen, you believe in God. She was raised a Methodist, Methodist church. She'd been to Bible studies and things like that, but it really wasn't serving the Lord either, you know? Uh, and so um, I said, well, let's ask the Lord whether we need to get married. And so we had a living Bible, which was at that time, the Bible that was very popular. And it was a paraphrased version of the Bible, but I'm glad it was paraphrased because it would have had probably said something that was, was a little hard to understand, but it was from the book of Ruth. Um, and I said, I said, Kathy, I said, well, let's pray, ask God whether we should get married or not. So she went to the other side of the room and she prayed and I prayed. And I said, okay, close your eyes, open the Bible and point to a verse. I said, whatever that verse says, that's what we'll take from the Lord, whether we should get married or not get married. So she closed her eyes, opened, opened it and pointed to a scripture. And it was from the book of Ruth, which was kind of cool. And, um, and it was, and it was the scripture where she says, it is I, Ruth, make me your wife, according to God's holy ordinances or holy laws. So in, in the King James, I think it says something like spread your skirt over your handmaiden, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, which if we would have looked into it, that's what that means. But I, I didn't believe it, you know, even though we prayed and I, I believed in God and I said, I said, you gotta be kidding I said, no, she said, that's what it says, you know? Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I was just blown away. She was blown away. And I said, well, let's, let's go ahead and get married. And so I felt like God told us to get married. So we went to the justice of the peace immediately about 11 o'clock at night, got married. And that was that, you know? And then we got married in front of our, our family uh, about two weeks later. Yeah. We had a, a little ceremony, but yeah yeah so um that's incredible um oh, yeah, here's, here's an here, excuse me here's the here's the incredible part 45 almost 45 years we've been married yeah. in october yeah. so that's the incredible part yeah yeah it's beautiful um so i want to talk about uh it's unbelievable um hearing you know this is what made me want to reach out to you is here you are in this rock and roll band, you're in the lifestyle. Um, I feel like this, 
it, 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 it's just, it couldn't even be written as a movie to think that now the rest of your bandmates are, are going to come to know the Lord and you're now going to actually be a Christian rock band when, when Christian rock really doesn't even exist. I didn't really even think about that. Um, yeah. when I, when I first kind of read your bio, um, you know, I'm real big into Christian rap. And so, you know, I saw how kind of hip hip hop kind of emerged in the nineties. Uh, yeah. and, and there's some pushback with that, which was kind of similar to what your experience happened when, when, when you started doing Christian rock in, in the eighties, um, because mm-hmm. at the time, um, and there's still some of that, uh, that you, you hear in, in church today that, uh, you know, rock is evil. Um, and so, uh, talk about, um, talk about that, that, that calling and how that came about, uh, this, this idea to pursue Christian rock and, and how much pushback was there, um, once you actually pursued that. Okay. Uh, well, like you said, the guys in the band, um, they gave, they came to the Lord they had their own, they had their own stories, amazing stories, how they came to the Lord, but it kind of, it kind of, you know, you, you sow seeds in people's lives, and uh, in the case of David, you know, he always uh, refers to me in his testimony as the one who, who really was the first one to really, um, you know, he saw the reality of Jesus uh, uh, after my constant witnessing to him, and uh, so, you know, and then I came and I said, we needed to change the lyrics of the song and all that. And um, that was back in 74. Uh, but in 1979, I had married Kathy. We had left, I left the band and, and, and moved to California for a little while and uh, with my wife. And um, during that time, they all came to the Lord and began playing in churches by 1977 without a drummer yeah and it was just the guitar and, and bass and, and and keyboards you know and uh, they they came to the lord like in a black church they went to a black church and uh, you know they were they were received at first but then you know it was like eventually it was like what are these white guys doing in this black church <laughs> to the black people you know it's like you know, it's like, it's like a different, you know, they were just don't. And so this other Pentecostal church invited them to come. Um, and, and, or they, they just basically, this, this one guy invited David to go to a Pentecostal church that he met in a restaurant. And then he went to this church and then uh, started a relationship with the pastor there. And the pastor had a, had a, a prophetic word. He said that God was going to, um, use um had, had somebody come into the church that he was going to use in a musical way and that we were going to that that band was going to play before you know audiences of big theaters and 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 you know thousands of people you know mm-hmm. and um and so he thought the pastor thought it was going to be some country group you know because that's what he was into was this country country western stuff you know yeah. and uh or or, or full or gospel you know f- uh, gospel quartet or something and um uh, and so these these rockers with long hair show up and it's david and his brother you know and so you know, they started you know getting a relationship when he said well this is the band this this is the one uh, that, that the vision was talking about and so um they kept calling me and asked me to join the band and i would always kind of i wanted to make sure that you know that it was right or whatever and um you know, I tell about it in my book where one day it just hit me like a, a bolt of lightning that I had to quit playing. I was playing secular music still at that point and uh, witnessing the guys in the band, you know, witnessing all these people all the time, you know. And um, but but it just said, you know, like call David and say that, you know, uh, you'd like to get in, you know, join the band. So I called David and uh, I said, David, I said, if you haven't gotten another drummer by now, I said, I'd love to come in the band uh, to join the band, you know, pl- start playing with you guys, you know, because I knew it would be a sacrifice, but, but I knew that it would, it would be something that God would bless. And um, he said, he said, man, it's, it's amazing that you called us tonight because we were just about to get this other drummer 
from Dallas that was going to play the drums, you know, for us. Yeah. But we were praying for you, but, you know, so anyway, I, that's, that's when I joined them, you know, and, um, you know, it, it just was, uh, it was funny because, you know, I kind of was the first person to talk to, to the band about the Lord. And then my wife, after we started playing Christian music, Kathy, you know, she was a believer, a Christian. She was a God, God, you know, she feared God. And, um, but she was not born again. And she came to one of our early concerts at that church and came up at when, when the altar call was, was, was given, she came up to the front and gave her life to the Lord and was born again. And, uh, it was just, it was like, she just changed from that moment on. Yeah. And we were, we were, we were, um, it, it was just a, it's funny how God just brings, uses people, you know, you pull one person and another person pulls you and, you know, pull somebody else, you know, it's like, it's like a whole, it's like a puzzle, you know? And, um, but I was, I was, um, I was praying one night because Kathy was a ballet dancer, like I said, and she was dancing with a secular company here in Mississippi. And uh, she was with, with the ballet Mississippi. And uh, she was like the prima ballerina, the main ballet, ballet dancer. And uh, I prayed that God would use her, you know, use the dance for his kingdom. Because I saw in the Bible where in, in Psalm 149 and 150, it's, it talks about to praise his name with the dance. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, praise his name with the music. Praise his name with the dance. So I, I saw all these biblical, um, you know, stamp of approvals for these things that they're done unto the Lord. So that's, that's when I, you know, uh, I started praying for Kathy to, to leave the, the secular ballet and to uh, start a Christian dance company that, that uses ballet yeah yeah so um that's one, something i wanted to talk about because um you know you also s still see this in the church where you know rock is evil or even dance is, is evil and i think it's incredible to see you know you and kathy both were so gifted uh you on the drums her as a dancer and you know god didn't call you to renounce rock and roll and join a monastery uh, and same thing with Kathy. And it's so beautiful to see that you both took your gift and are doing it for God's kingdom. Um, and uh, you know, the ballet, same thing. And I never heard, I've never heard of such. Um, so talk <laughs> about, talk about the ballet, how, um, you know, so just, just, just some background, you know, uh, Kathy at the time when she left, uh, you know, she's, you know, literally one of the the best ballet dancers in in the world and she's mm -hmm. the principal dancer in, in in this company she's been with a long time um and and to leave that to start something from from nothing and it's something that doesn't exist that shows a huge um leap of faith uh on, on her part so so with that being said um talk about uh talk about the ballet, what it is, uh, and, and how, how are you guys using, uh, dance, uh, to, to glorify God? Okay. Um, um, well, like I was praying that she would leave the secular company and dance for the Lord, uh, at that point after, you know, she was born again. And, uh, so it's about two, two years after she was born again, that the Lord started speaking words, you know, through, through pastors, through, through people that said that, and she was going to be a pioneer, you know, in dance. And um, so I'd always kind of told her, I said, yeah, time to go. But she always kind of wanted the right time. And so she's good at pay more patient things. And I'm more like, let's do it right now, you know. Yeah. And uh, but but so um, I was praying. I was on the road with David and the Giants somewhere in like Illinois or something like that. And I was fasting and praying that she would leave the, the secular company and and uh, started a ministry using ballet, which had never been done before. That, that was done on the scale that, that we did it. And uh, I had a dream one night, the last day of my fast, and the dream, 
I heard all this, be this beautiful music in my dream. And it was like angelic voices singing over and over again. It's like this incredible heavenly music saying, the Magnificat, the Magnificat, the Magnificat, the Magnificat. And I just kept hearing that. I woke up from that and I was, going, I was saying, well, that, that's kind of like from my Catholic background, you know, the Song of Mary, when she found out she was going to be the mother of the Savior. It's called the Magnificat. And um, it means to, to magnify God. So I said, um, I just kind of kept it back in my heart. So what has this got to do with Kathy, you know, in the ballet, you know? So fast forward um, to 1986. And um, I knew that it had something to do with Kathy and leaving the, and leaving the secular ballet. So when the name, when Kathy first started the ballet, it was like a faith act. It was basically she left the ballet and made the front page of the news here um, that the, the principal dancer was leaving the ballet and starting uh, a Christian dance company. So we got a call from the president of Bellhaven University, which is a local uh, college here. And um, he said, look, I'm a Christian. He was a Christian you know, university. And he said, I, I would like to help you guys start. You know, so I wanna offer you studio space and office space and the use of a computer, which back in 1986, you know, you didn't have very many computers out there. Yeah, um, so it was just her. And she asked uh, one of the, this choreographer guy that had helped her do some choreography, uh, which she, she had won the silver medal, which is a very prestigious um, uh, international ballet competition event that Mikhail Baryshnikov, some of these famous ballet dancers won gold, she won the silver medal. Uh, and so um, she's very well known in that. So, um, so she, she started this with just herself and about two other dancers, one dancer from here that was a Christian that said that she would, you know, she, yeah, she could, she could, she could get to the idea of dancing for the Lord. And, um, and then just one by one, they started coming from California, from New York, um, from Illinois, I mean, from Indiana, um, from Ohio. Uh, they started coming to Jackson and uh, we, just, we just all believers, you know, they left their, their companies and they left their, their homes and they said, you know, this sounds really interesting. A, a Christian ballet company in Mississippi. Let's go see what this is about, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's kind of how it started, you know, it just started really, really small. And we were like operating out of our van and, you know, I was traveling with David and the Giants, you know, but I'd go on some trips with them and she'd come on some trips with us. And our daughter, you know, by this time, Tara was born in 1979. And um, so we just, we just basically felt that God had a reason, you know, and, and a purpose, just like he had a purpose for uh, the band to do churches and to do theaters and to do, to be a Christian rock band. Um, you know, not everybody was on board with it. You know, there was people, religious people in, in churches that would, you know, stand up and walk out, you know, when they heard us play and they would, you know, when the idea of a Christian ballet company came to the uh, forefront uh, with Kathy, um, some of the board members of, of the ballet Mississippi, which she was with, you know, they, they said, you, you're never going to you're never going to do anything with this ballet. You're never going to get support for this ballet. You, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, you've got all this and you're leaving this for this, you know, it's nothing, you know? And, um, and these are like really, you know, well off, you know, well healed people, you know, and we just knew that this was the right road to do. And it's better to, better to obey God than to, you know, to listen to man, you know? So that's what happened. And we just kept going step by step. And little by little, you know, uh, we would, they would write out, you know, letters to churches and talking about the ballet and, and people, churches would say, well, come on, let's, we'll have you come over here and do something, you know, over here. And, and uh, the ballet would, would, would do worship pieces and worshipful pieces and would testify and um, give a testimony, a short testimony of their lives and why they're doing this. And, what God's done in their life. And um, God started using Ballet Magnificat, the ministry. And um, 
right now it's the premier Christian ballet company in the world. There's nothing like it, you know. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like it. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so this, uh, I guess um, I'm gonna kind of switch gears here in a little bit, but I want to talk uh, about one experience you read about in your book. You were giving a concert and I think it was an outdoor concert. There were some punk rockers and you felt that there was uh, um, some spiritual warfare going on mm-hmm. because they, they were not, um, they were hostile to, you know, to, to the message you were bringing uh, in their city. I think you were there for a few days, um, but uh, God honored it. Uh, can you um, just recall that, that story? Sure. That's a good one. Uh, that that was uh the first the first year i was with i was with the band when i left um and just joined david and the giants as a christian band my wife was pregnant at the time and um she was getting ready to have a baby and we had a baby and and we had a baby in april and uh kathy had a baby and and, uh it's our daughter tara and uh, she's 42 now and we have a grandson, Bryson, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. But uh, the band was was asked to go to England to do a, a, a revival uh, in England. And um, so we were uh, set up in Oxford, you know, where Oxford University is in, in a park there. And uh, we had a tent set up and um, these punk rockers would come uh, because the music would attract them you know they would just right. walk around. this is back in 1979 and it's just like you know the first part of the punk rock deal and um so they heard the music and they liked it and but then then all of a sudden they started hearing what words we were singing in the song and uh it just didn't go with what they were thinking it was going to be you know and uh they started cursing us and cussing and and just just getting angry at us. I mean, threw rocks at, at the tent and you know, knocked down one of our microphones and and then threatened to burn our tent down if we stayed there and all this kind of stuff. And um, and we we just kept, you know, we we thought to ourselves, well, yeah, you know, this is kind of getting serious over here. I don't know whether we need to to go back to this tent, but we felt like ballet, you know, this is. Holy Spirit is here. We're 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 in the middle of this. We're going to keep going back here and do it. So we kept going back and playing, and um, these guys kept coming back and, and kind of harassing us for a while. But then one of the guys, his name was Steve, uh, he came forward to an altar call that we had. We used to do this song called Noah at the at the end, and it was kind of like an altar call song. It was very dramatic, and um, and he came to he came forward and, and gave his life to the Lord and uh, was prayed for and uh, he became kind of a new guy, you know. He's all of a sudden he's he's a he's a good guy, you know. And um, and and the other guys looked at him like, well, well you know, we must be something to this, you know. Right. So so these guys they came to the Lord. They all came to the Lord, you know. And we got to the point where. Uh, they, you know, we baptized them one evening uh, in the River Thames. They uh, they brought their motorcycles up in the light, shown the lights on the, on, the, on the river, and we just baptized them right there in the name of Jesus uh, at the River Thames, and and just had this this friendship with them, you know, and and it was like something really wondrous God was doing, you know, yeah. in in those guys and and for that time and season, and um, they had tears in their eyes when we left to go back to the U S they didn't want us to leave. I mean, at first they were ready to kill us, but then yeah. you know, they, they were, uh, they were tearful when we left, but that was, that was a cool, that, that was cool how God used that. You know, God just, you know, he uses music, he uses dance. He can use anything, you know, that's, that's scriptural. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, that, that, that he can use any means and, one thing, you know, when I was in the Catholic Church, I'm not in the Catholic Church anymore, of course, but but the Holy Spirit is not confined to any one place. The Holy Spirit can show up anywhere 
there's hearts with faith he can show up Amen. and that, that that's what i'd like to say you know there, there's no fences you can't you can't fence god out of places yeah yeah it's an amazing story uh something else that uh what was awesome in your book, uh, part of your sanctification was forgiving your father. Um, can you talk about that? Well, I think that's uh, probably one of the most important things that happened in my life was after I came and had that experience with the Lord and uh, was saved and born again. Um, I saw how Jesus had forgiven me so much for my sins. I saw that, you know, I was unforgivable. I yeah. mean, I, if, I, if I was me, I wouldn't forgive me. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But Jesus forgave me. So I looked at my dad in a different way after I was born again. I looked at him just like I was. You know, you know all the crazy bad things he did, you know, he's no different than, than I am. Yeah. You know, before I kind of put him on a pedestal and I said, you know, he was kind of like a, a god, you know, like, you know, he was supposed to be my, my um, you know, my pattern, you know, from my life. And, um, but I looked at him just, just like he was just, he was just susceptible to the same things I was in life. And so I, I made up my mind that at this point, uh, I was, let's see how old I, I, was, I was, some years later, um, I hadn't had a relationship with my dad. I, I didn't want to see my dad for many years after that, uh, from the age 15 to you know, when I was born again, 20, 24 years old, I didn't really have a, a relationship with him. I just really thought he was the worst thing in the world and um, didn't want to know him, didn't want to know his wife, didn't want to know the child that he had with his wife. And uh, so I, I actually sought him out and found him. Um, he was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at that point with his wife and, and his son uh, that he had out of wedlock. Um, and uh I went to his apartment and said, you know, I just, hey, dad, you know, and, and just met him, you know, saw him again and and just uh, just had this love for him, you know, and I just just I, said, I just wanted to meet your wife and I just had this love. And I just said, God, dad, I just want to tell you, I, you know, I forgive you. And I, 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 I just want to tell you what happened to me, you know. Yeah. And, and if God can forgive me. I could forgive you. And, um, you know, that, that started a, a whole kind of witnessing to my dad from that point on, you know, in my life. Um, because when I first came to the Lord, my dad would, would say, uh, well, Keith, that's, uh, you know, just something you're, you're probably just gonna, you know, pass, you know, th th this feeling of God thing will pass. And, you know, it's just a phase you're going through or whatever. Right. And I said, no, dad. I said, no, dad, this is a real thing. I said, this is, this is deep down inside. This is it, man. This is, this is God working, you know? And uh, I just kept witnessing my dad and, and talking to him about Jesus and the Holy spirit. And, um, you know, just never gave up. And the, the day that he died, he actually Skyped me and we, which he never did. Yeah. And he, about two or three hours before he passed away, he skyped me and he had, he had, he had died by kind of an accident. Um, but um, he just wanted to say how proud he was that I was serving Jesus and uh, just how proud he was of all, all of my brothers and sisters, you know, and just, just sort of like just, and I thought it was strange, you know, that he would, that, that he would do that, you know? And um, at the very end of the, at, at the very end of the, of the conversation, you know, he didn't know how to, push end on, on the sky so he, he, but he looked at me and he said well I, he said do you want me to end it or you want to end it I said I looked at my dad I said dad I said why don't you just end it and he said and he's looking I see he said okay and then he, he just got off the got off the sky and then I heard about three hours later my sister called and said that he had he died in kind of an accident thing that happened to him and, um, mm. but it was, it was interesting how God kind of gave me that closure, you know, Yeah. and how, how he, he actually, he never really acknowledged Jesus. He always acknowledged the spirit of God, but he never acknowledged Jesus. And that day he did. Wow. 
Wow. And he's and he said he was proud of me that day. And uh, so I'll, I'll I'll never forget that. That was good. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, so I'm gonna move on uh, to some, you know, kind of quicker questions. But one last thing before I, I kind of shift gears, you mentioned <clears throat> in, in your book, um, you you had a about a depression, you know, kind of when you know before you had, had met the Lord, and afterwards as well. So I, I believe this was, uh, I believe when you were in California before you uh, rejoined um, David and the Giants. Uh, mm-hmm. So. Can you speak to, to depression, how you came out of that? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, again, it, it was just me and me and the word of God at that point with the depression thing. And uh, I went to California and, um, you know, I, I've been asked to, to, um, to join a band called Starbuck, which had a, a big hit out called Moonlight Feels Right. They were playing at um, Six Flags. In, in LA there. Um, and I played with a couple guys in, in the band before and they saw me, you know, they, they, they got me tickets to come. And so I came with Kathy uh, and they said, you know, we're looking for another drummer and we want to come with us. And I said, sure, you know, so where, where are we going? They said, Atlanta. So I said, okay, I don't have any money to get to Atlanta. So their agency gave me some money and gave us money to, to make the trip to Atlanta. And, Went to Atlanta for two weeks. I, I rehearsed with them, and and uh, and uh, I got fired. First time I ever got fired from from playing music, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kathy was crying, you know. We just got married at that point, and uh, you know I was took her from one end of the country to another, and uh, we just didn't know what was going to happen to us. And I said, you know, I said Kathy, I said this is the, I said I know it just looks terrible, and I was I was really mad too. I was kind of angry. I said, this is the very best thing that could ever happen to us, uh, that we're not in this, you know, this situation. So we went back to Mississippi. And then, you know, the next thing I was, I joined David and the Giants, the Christian band. And, um, but I, I have, str- I, I struggle with depression a lot of my life, especially, you know, when I got into the drugs and stuff, I just kind of like intensified the depression stuff. But I would say that the word of God, the word of God, uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He, he got into bouts of depression. Um, you know, when Saul was after him, when King Saul was after him, um, he would, he would, the Bible says he would encourage himself in the Lord. And so when, when depression would try to creep in, I think that's, in my case, the word of God has to drown out the word of Satan or the word of the world or the world of depression uh, the word of God in someone I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you the word says and so I think the more of the word you have the more you can draw from that word and declare that word in your life and declare his promises like David did and and actually when you do that the enemy cannot cannot stand against the word of God yeah you know if you have the word of God in you he cannot stand against it you know, he may fight against it, but he can't stand against it because it, God gives us all power and authority over the power of the enemy. And that's what that's what that's what believers have to do. Is they have to to grab a hold of that. They have to grab a hold of their their authority in the word, you know, and you can't have authority unless you have the word in you. You yeah. can't speak. You know, it says like when, when when the when the Jewish exorcists tried to to uh, you know throw out a demon in this this man they that that de- demonic man jumped on those seven jewish exorcists who said you know we we uh we cast you out in the name of the name of jesus whom paul preaches you know it's like they were kind of like doing it second hand and this demon said this demon said well paul i know and jesus i know but but who in the world are you you know yeah. and he tore those guys up so you can't you can't have authority unless the word of God is in you and it's actually living and it's authentic. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I want to shift gears now. Um, so uh, I'll ask you these uh, like series of questions. Uh, favorite Bible character, Bible book uh, and Bible verse. I was thinking about that. I like the questions. Um, 
I like I like Daniel. I like Daniel. I, I would like I think that's probably one of my favorite characters along with Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. Yeah. I mean, and I, I tear up every time I, I I really read that story and just, you know, when his brothers come and he forgives his brothers because uh, he's a picture of Christ. You know, Joseph mm -hmm. is that picture of Christ. And, um, you know, those two characters, uh, there's nothing really bad said about them. You know, King David, yeah. I like him. I love him. But yet, you know, he fell into sin and he had a lot of, you know, bad things happen. But I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect people, but I kind of like those characters. Yeah. Um, I like Enoch, too, because he was translated and he walked with God. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you got a favorite um, book and, or verse? Uh, favorite book is probably Zechariah. I like Zechariah because it's kind of like a mini revelation. And yeah. uh, it's kind of a, a, a it's, it's a cool book. And uh, the verse, uh, I, I, I like... I've been I got I've been meditating on this verse that um, lately that um, that you know Christ was bruised for our iniquities, uh, pierced for our transgressions, and by His stripes we were healed. And um, that that word bruised, um, it, it's uh, you know when we get bruised, it's like blood coagulates inside of us. So He was bruised for our iniquities. So so when Jesus died, He died for those inner sins too, that people don't see. And then he was pierced and the blood came out on the outside and was manifested outside of his body for our transgressions. Those things that, that wow. we do outwardly wrong. Wow. You see what I'm talking about? Yes, powerful. And then we were healed by, we were, by his stripes we were healed. So that's like a past tense thing. So I yeah. kind of like that too. So it's like, Let's, let's just stand on that. You know? Yeah, that's incredible. Um, all right. Uh, so what about favorite uh, movies, uh, music, and, and books? Well, I'm going to kind of kind of shock you here. Sound of Music is probably one of my favorite movies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I watched have, you ever, it recently. have you ever seen it? You've seen I it? I watched it just recently, uh, actually. Um, yeah, it's great. The original one? Yeah. Yeah. I like it because it, it's a, uh, it, 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 it kind of talks, it's kind of like relevant to where we are right now, you know, I really? feel like uh, just in, in culturally and, and, and uh, politically and, and stuff and America and Austria, just, just the parallels between those two, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and Nazi Germany and just the new world order and those kinds of things. I'm, I'm always very interested in the prophetic things, you know, the nations. But um, the other movie would be Schindler's List. I love Schindler's List. I thought it's, I thought it brings a tear. I mean, I, I it, you know, God's got a heart for Israel. He brought Israel back in 1948 because of those things that happened in Nazi Germany. Israel became a state. So it, it's like, it's, it's just too, too cool. Um, I like the original Star Wars. That was good. Yeah. So, um, music, books. Uh, like um, I, I lean toward jazz. I lean toward things like Steely Dan, Toto. Um, you know, that's in the secular realm. Uh, music. Um, I mean, obviously, I like uh, I like uh, some stuff from the Belonging. It's good music from the Belonging. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're a church in Nashville. Um, I like. All kinds of music. I mean, I, I'd, I'd be too too long for me to say, but right. um, I like jazz fusion. I kind of lean toward that uh, funk, that kind of stuff. Can you give me uh, books in particular that you enjoy? Uh, I, I read a lot of a lot of books um, uh, on prophetic things. Um, uh, just uh, some of Jonathan Kahn's books I like. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's got some pretty cool, cool books. Yeah, I've read the Oracle. Uh, yeah. In his newest um, Harbinger 2. Incredible. Yeah. 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 It, it's pretty cool. I believe he's a, I believe he's a, a, a current day Jeremiah prophet type. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Really. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you as far as prophecy. I, <laughs> I read a lot of books on eschatology and prophecy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, what do you like to do uh, in your free time? Well, when we have some free time, I like to, uh, my, my wife and I like to uh, ride bikes or cy- our cycling, you know, we like that. Um, like to, uh, my, my daughter and, and son-in-law and our grandson moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And I really, I really like that. Yeah. They, they love it in Phoenix and I like hiking and things like that. You know? Yeah, cool. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with five people, dead or alive, uh, who would they be? All right. Einstein. Wow. Wow. Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. Um, Corey Tim Boone. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, I, that's, that's getting... Where am I going to go now with this? Um, um, maybe George Reeves. I don't know. If, George Reeves was the original Superman. Oh, okay. Okay. He was on the Al of Lucy show. One of my yeah. Al of Lucy show episodes. Yeah. There's, there, but um, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who Who would you say? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I I mean, Jesus, um, outside of there, I don't know. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but he's alive, right? Well, I mean, I, you, pick, you can pick people alive. They don't have to be dead. You can pick, you know, dead or alive. Um, oh, you said that's right, dead or alive. That's true. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. Well, okay, let's go two more people. I said, uh, um, uh, Jonathan Kahn and, um, and Franklin Graham. Okay, sweet uh yeah i love that group yeah that's great Um, that'd that'd be a great dinner um all right so like i said that was a that's our last question um so thank you so much uh for doing the interview um and and, any pardon your words your book for those listening uh is life after lucy great book um if you you know we just kind of touched the surface uh, on, on your story today that uh no, you really wrote wrote it all in that book, um, and I, I quite enjoyed that. But uh, thank you for the interview. Any uh, parting words? Um, how do people get in touch with uh, you know your, your music or uh, the ballet? Yeah, uh, just just appreciate you and appreciate your uh, your uh, ministry of doing this podcast. I think it's very important. You know, even more so in these days. You know, when we're on this lockdown, mm-hmm. drag out fights around here. Uh, but uh, with the COVID thing, but um, I just uh, just want to point everybody to, uh, you know, somebody's interested in Ballet Magnificat, uh, my, my wife and I's ministry, um, it's, 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 it's BalletMagnificat.com is our website. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, um, all that stuff. And um, David and the Giants is on iTunes. Uh, we have a bunch of albums on there. We have... Uh, you can go to davidhuff.com, I believe, and, and you'll go to our website there. And we have a Facebook page for David and the Giants. And, and uh, we still play. We still, we still uh, record. We still uh, do concerts uh, across the country. Um, um, not, I mean, not as much as we used to, but, but we, we do uh, occasional things to things uh, that, that we want to take and that we're able to take. So, Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much uh for doing this i appreciate it um and uh all right i'll i'll, I'll, I'll let you go thank you man appreciate it. nice right. meeting you. yeah absolutely nice meeting you as well there you have it ladies and gentlemen hope you enjoy that as much as i did uh, i think keith's story just really highlights how we as christian can use our gifts to glorify god amazing to see what God has done in his life. If you enjoyed it, share, rate, review, like, and subscribe. You can contact me at the weirdchristianpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll catch you on the next one.